So thank you all for joining us today. My name is Jamie Gray, and I'm the director for the distributed e-library here at Weill Cornell Medicine in Qatar. And we're delighted to welcome you all to the opening session of today's Evolving Health Information Landscape Symposium. Before I introduce our first keynote speaker, I just wanted to share a few quick housekeeping details for the symposium today. To listen to the session in Arabic, please click on the translation icon and select the Arabic language option from the menu. For captioning, please click on the closed caption icon and select enable. And finally, to send a question to our presenter, please use the Q&A panel. Um, for sessions with more than one presenter, please be sure to include their name at the start of your question so the moderator knows who to direct your question to. So without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alawid Alkaja. Dr. Alkaja is the copyright librarian at Qatar National Library. He manages the library's open access fund and serves as its representative on the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Sciences Services Board. Before joining the library, Dr. Alkaja worked in open science publishing with Pew Science and HB King Press. He holds a PhD in molecular biology from the International Max Planck Research School and an MBA from the Alliance Manchester Business School in the UK. So Dr. Alkaja, thank you so much for joining us today and the floor is yours. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, can you hear me fine? Um, can you see me as well? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, and okay, um, let me just uh, share the screen. And I hope, can you, I mean, the, the slides are appearing. Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. So <laughs> good morning, everybody. Um, um, yeah, it's my pleasure to be here today, and you know, it's an honor to um, <clears throat> have this opening keynote, which I hope would set the stage and tone for the what looks to be an amazing symposium. So thank you for the organizers for the invitation. And today I'll be talking about open access and open science, and how both open access and open science infrastructure specifically can be a lifeline for health. And in this case, it's health information, but also, I think it's also for health professionals in general. So how, I mean, a bit, a bit, a bit about myself and how I've reached the stage. Um, so I've got a background in molecular biology. Um, I've worked with open access publishing for several years, and now I'm in the, in the library also doing open access um, from open access advocacy to um, managing the open access fund. And I think I best describe myself would be, I mean, the best description of myself would be an open access advocate um, to support open access and open science. And today we'll be talking about open science, right? And I do hope uh, that by today's presentation, I can convince you that open access is actually good and open science is good, and how it could help um, health information. Um, I'll be giving examples of local open science initiatives. I'll be talking about a bit some global open science initiatives as well. And, but mainly I want to talk about um, the challenges for <clears throat> open science, and more specifically about sustainability. How can we make open science sustainable? Some definitions and a bit of background, perhaps, before we talk about the very kind of important stuff. What is open science? Now, it's an umbrella term that could, um, you know, describe the, the several different things, from open access publishing to open data to open reproducible research to open science evaluation, such as like peer review, to open science policies and open science infrastructure and tools. Now you can actually go into much more detail because each one has several terms within it. So for example, when we talk about open data, and this is from Foster who uh, um, um, defined or class tried to map out different definitions. So for the open data, for example, you have um, uh, the repositories, uh, it's gonna affect open data on, on government and open lab books with repository. So it's a lot of different definitions, but Today, we're only looking about a bit, like a small part of it. So uh, we're, there's no time to go into details of every single thing, but I do invite you to explore this further after this presentation. 
what's important for us is to define what we mean by open, right? And having free access or something for free, um, although I don't believe anything is for free, but having free access is only one part of the solution. Now, when it comes to open access publishing, or in, let's say in open in general, you need something that is free to use, something that could be shared with anybody for any purpose without uh, much restriction, and something that could also be modified, so to build upon the work. And when it comes, for example, in uh, data and open data repositories, um, we often um, refer to data being fair. And what fair means is something that is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So as you can see, free is only part of the, the solution. What open science does is if you look at the, the scientific cycle, right? The, from hypothesis or ideation to collecting data, to processing data, restoring it, long-term preservation, distributing it either through a journal or other type of publication, or even in a data repository. And then the second, the, the last step would be reused by others or by yourself, and then again, the ideation. And what open science tries to do is to introduce <clears throat> kind of open practices at each step. So for example, I mean, the, more, the most obvious one would be with publications and distributions. So the idea is that you would uh, publish in uh, open access journals or use an open access repository. But you know, when if, and, and the thing is with open science, the, the encouragement is that you could look into every single step. So when you come at data collection, you need to start thinking, how will you be distributing this data? And what licenses do you need? Um, and if you're storing it, um, are you gonna be using uh, infrastructure? And the idea is to encourage uh, users and scientists and researchers to use open infrastructure. And I'll come to what that uh, means uh, later on. Now, open science is good, right? It promotes accurate verification. It reduces duplication because if everybody knows what everybody is doing, then it kind of reduces waste when it comes to research. It can increase productivity. Um, innovation and also what's really nice is that citizen science for example what what when information is open everybody has access to it and the public can engage better with the science <clears throat> when it comes to open access publishing um more specifically with publishing so open publications increased visibility can lead to higher citations um can reach much many many more people and um, in many cases allows researchers to uh, satisfy the grant regulations or grant uh, policies. When it comes to the health field, um, medical practitioners would have a larger variety, a wider variety of uh, content to access. Um, uh, and they're not restricted to what the institution has a subscription to. And patients themselves would also be able to access peer reviewed articles. <clears throat> and be more aware of the literature and be more informed. Now, an example here is a paper that was published in 20, March 2020, the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2, uh, right? And this was, and this is um, a screenshot from Altmetric, which basically tracks the number of times a paper has been cited, the number of times it's been used, on uh, news outlets, social media, etc., and this is the number one article. It has a like a forty thousand score, which means that uh, uh, more than seven hundred times it was it was like uh, <clears throat> featured in news outlets. It was tweeted more than seventy thousand times, and it was spread over the internet. And this article, well, not necessarily open access, but it was for free. So it just shows you the importance of having access to information. Now, I think at this point, before we talk about sustainability, it's really important to talk about some myths and to address some misconceptions when it comes to open access and open science. The first myth is that access is not a problem. And we hear this often saying, well, well we have subscriptions and so why open access? <clears throat> but the reality is that 
um, we do not have access to all scholarly literature and journal subscriptions. And by we, I don't necessarily mean my institution, but we as a community in general. This subscription or the access varies from one country to another, from one institution to another. And it's not necessarily that high income countries have all the access. But what we see is that some countries have zero access and other countries have more. So the information is not distributed equally. There's no equity when it comes to uh, information distribution and open access or open science is a solution. <clears throat> Again, something more specific to open access is that uh, one misconception is that open access, to publish open access is expensive. Yes, it can be expensive. Some journals um, would charge a thousand dollars, others three thousand. But the reality is that many open access journals are free to publish, and many publishers worldwide offer waivers for countries from low income and low middle income countries. <clears throat> now, the third myth is that yes, I love open access and I want to publish open access, but I have to pay for myself. And the reality is that authors. Yeah, they do sometimes have to pay, but there are options um, from grants, universities, and also APC funds. Now, these options might not be available for everybody worldwide, but that should be our goal as a community to make sure that authors do not pay themselves. Maybe the fourth and the last thing that I'm gonna discuss is that open access articles, and I say we can extend it to open science, it's not peer reviewed. So there's a trust issue. Um, authors, um, and honestly, I mean, like when I, the, when I did this, I know, right? the first time I heard about open access uh, was a quite long, longer during my, uh, my graduate studies. And, you know, it was like, the, it was known, yeah, it's, it's free to pub, it's, you pay to publish, therefore it's fast and it's not that great, but that's not really true, right? So <clears throat> open access journals are peer reviewed like subscription journals. And just because an article is available without a subscription that is free online, doesn't mean it's not peer reviewed, right? And authors have these different tools that can help them build trust and credibility of the journals that they publish in. <coughs> so one of them is think, check, check, submit, which kind of allows or makes the author think where they're publishing, um, check certain criteria. And once this is satisfies these criteria, then this like, it will encourage to submit. So please go to thinkcheck-submit.com. I think that's the URL that you can find out. My favorite is Director of Open Access Journals. So a couple of years ago, um, I'm sure many authors heard of these blacklists where they say, these journals are bad, don't publish in them. But then came the Director of Open Access Journals and said, instead of, uh, blacklisting journals, a better approach would be to have, a, let's say, a whitelist that uh, the community uh, would assess these journals and say they are, these are good and based on certain criteria. So the director of open access journals, journals is the probably the best uh, place for you to check if the journal is uh, has credibility and something that you can trust. Another way to address the, the trust and credibility issue is open peer review. Now, peer review um, in journals are either single blind or double blind, depending on the field. And in most cases, the authors don't know who the peer reviewers are. And in most cases as well, the peer reviewers' names are not publicly made or publicly available. Now, some journals and publishers have tried to address this by using open peer review. And there's like no one um, solution like for, for everything or one fit all solution. So for example, I've just put in some example from BMG Open, BMC, Copernicus Publications, and F4000 Research. Each one does things differently. But what's important is that, you know, about uh, the, the peer review is that <clears throat> there's a general, let's say, observation that peer review can be unre or unreliable, it can be inconsistent, and there's no accountability. Um, what this system does is tries to kind of make it more transparent. Not only do authors know who the peer reviewers are and the peer reviewers might know who the authors are. What's really great about this system is that during the process of peer review, there's a lot of communication going back and forth between authors, editors, and the peer reviewers. 
and some publishers are making this like, conversation publicly available. So there's a lot of value in knowing this, right? So with open peer review, it tries to address this issue of stress occurring. Now that I've addressed some of the myths and introduced you to the idea of what open science and open access um, is, I want to show you some of the local uh, open science initiatives in Qatar. And one of them, or two of them, are in Qatar University. So you've got QSpace, which is Qatar University's open institutional repository. And you've got Qatar University Press. Both um, use open licenses. Um, and the idea is to uh, maximize the, the reach of, in the first place, Qatar University's faculty's uh, output, and in the second, to introduce more journals in the Arabic language. Another example is Hamad al Khalifa University Press, which I used to work for, and QScience.com. And they have open access journals, open access conferences, and even open access uh, books. Now, let's talk about Qatar National Libraries. So Qatar National Library has two initiative, initiatives. The first one is the Open Initiative Award. And this award was now it's in its second year. And the idea is that we, as a library, recognize initiatives uh, locally, both on an institutional level and an individual level. Those who have supported open scholarship, um, which includes this kind of the sciences and uh, humanities, and of course, open science. Um, so we do hope to continue this. And the idea behind this is that we want to encourage um, others in the community by giving them great examples of how, what they can do. And of course, we would like to reward and encourage those who have practiced this already. Um, now, <clears throat> Qatar National Library's Open Access Fund is what kind of I do on a daily basis. And the idea of the fund is to cover open access publishing costs for Qatar-based researchers and to create and contribute to a permanent archive of the Qatar-based research at QNL. So the problem that we're trying to address is that, and, and this is also kind of uh, um, validated by the different surveys that we have uh, done over the last couple of years, authors in Qatar want to publish open access, right? They believe that open access is best for them. And I've been doing this for, almost 10 years now and the conversation was before like 10 years ago was <clears throat> what's open access why should i pay why 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 should you do that and we've evolved i would say from that conversation to how can i make my articles open access can you provide support so the fund here is to do that uh, specific task to reach out to authors who haven't, who don't have enough funding or don't have any institutional funding or grants and provide support for them to, uh, to publish open access. The other thing is because the articles are open access and uh, they are free to access and, and it's perpetual forever, we want to put them in a repository. The idea is that we want to make all of Qatar's research openly available. And this, is part of an archive that could survive generations and years to come. So we started this, uh, I mean, before I talk about uh, what we've done, we've noticed that, you know, in Qatar, open access research has grown uh, significantly in the last five years. So in 2016 and 17, it was about 25%. And in 2020, it's more than 50% of all publications in which uh, um, a publication has a Qatar-based corresponding author. And that's the criteria that we use because usually co uh, corresponding authors are responsible for the funding or paying the fees. So I think there's a lot of growth as we can see. And we would like to think that in our efforts at the library has contributed to this. But also we know that authors uh, have a higher awareness of open access and there's a higher demand for it. For Qatar specifically, we think that you know, open access <clears throat> is an enabling factor for interdisciplinary research. It's essential to have a knowledge-based economy because of the reuse factor in open access. And it provides more visibility and transparency for publicly funded research. And again, it's in uh, alignment with uh, the Qatar national objectives and goals. So over the last four years, and we started this, um, let's say June, July, 2018. And what happened is that, you know, we came together as a library, we said, we want to do this. 
we put a service, we tested, we launched, and luckily it had a high, uh, kind of there was a high demand for it. In total, we supported over uh, 2,000 uh, requests over um, three years, and we've supported uh, 1,001 unique authors of Qatar and supported 30 different institutions. And we do hope that uh, we can grow this further. And I'll explain, uh, this is the way it gets interesting because I'll explain how we as a community can do this. Now, for those who are interested in using the service, um, the, the criteria is that, is that we, so as you can see, we rely, uh, we rely on the Director of Open Access Journals as a, um, a criteria for trust and credibility. So your journal of choice should be listed in there. Um, we also ask that authors have exhausted all sources of funding for publication. And a must is that the corresponding author should be affiliated with a Qatar-based institution. If all these uh, criteria are met, then the library can support the article um, immediately. Now, this is, I mean, I tried to put a GIF somewhere, so this is the only one I have. Um, so how does this relate to health, right? We're here to talk about health information, right? And open access is key to supporting um, health information. And of course, another meme where we think open science is saving, is going to save health, right? Um, so what can open science do for health information? Well, I've talked to you about what open science is and what open access is and the benefits. So I think we could say is that open science can lead to more transparency. It can lead to more access to information, more accessibility, more accountability, and more collaborations. Now, accountability, collaborations, or at least collaboration is extremely important in the medical health field. Accountability is vital. <clears throat> so some global open science initiatives related to health information. The Human Genome Project, I mean, we can go back a while back. The Human Genome Project is one of the early examples of open science in which um, the, the human genome, at least the one that's a sequence, was made available for everybody to access. And this helped others contribute and helped uh, tremendous, a tremendous amount of research. And if you can look right now online and um, just searching on, on, and you can find several other examples. And these examples are not something that I would personally recommend. I'm just saying that there are examples. So there's uh, Peers, which is a platform for the change of experimental research standards in biomedicine. And then there is an open science pathway like um, um, for drug marketing authorization in which the review process and the applications and everything is made um, more transparent. And other programs which um, rely on open source infrastructure, open data um, for funding. So basically, um, and this is just an example for Parkinson's uh, research and Parkinson's disease research. If you can search online, you can find a lot. So, so from anything from um, open uh, uh, surveys to using open source uh, data or even um, open science in different fields such as the psychophysiologist. So there's a lot of open science in the health field, right? So it's not a matter of starting this right now in the medical field or the health profession. It's a matter of how we can support it further. And then, you know, our life changed last year. And it's still, I mean, we're still trying to accommodate the different changes that happened with, with the pandemic. Now I'm gonna use the, the pandemic as an example of why open science is necessary. So the World Health Organization, um, they have a database of global research on coronavirus disease, COVID-19. And if you can go online, you can find that there are more than 400,000 items. Majority of them are articles, but you also can find preprints, clinical trial registers, um, and then other documents such as project, project documentation and others. But the problem is that, you know, 400,000 items, that's great, but that's just a list of the items. Not everything is accessible. 
So what happened in um, early 2020, a um, number of, let's say, national science and technology advisors from several countries, as you can see from Australia, Brazil, Canada, the EU, the US, the UK, Singapore, Korea, New Zealand, and so on, and Japan, and Italy, and India, came together and um, declared that they would like, or there was a call for Open Access Act to, to COVID-19 public health. And the idea is that if everything is open access, that that could lead to a faster and better solution to the pandemic. But, and this is a message, and I'm not sure if any publishers today, but dear publishers, you know, thank you for the free access, but it is not enough. So what happened? Many publishers made, as you can see here, I and mean, just again, maybe a point about, it's a call for open access, but what publishers did, and it's great, I'm not saying it was, it's not great. They opened up the collections, any article that was, um, COVID-19 related was made either open access in minority cases, but in majority of cases they were made free, right? So everybody could get access. But my message is that it is not enough. Hopefully, and hopefully soon when this pandemic is over, who knows how the publishers will, what will they do with this content? Will they close it or will they continue making it free? We don't know. Right, and many publishers uh, have commercial interests. Right, they, they're selling these articles as subscriptions. So there's a, a bit of a risk that these articles are going to be closed. But if they're open access, that's not something that uh, that can happen. <clears throat> Again, with the kind of the, the pandemic, there's an open access database for the initial genome sequence of uh, the virus, and that that's helped um, identify solutions for the vaccine. Um, but of course, when it came to COVID, um, there were different, uh, several, like let's say, initiatives. One of which was to um, make the, the data from the randomized clinical trials open. And that idea behind that is introduce transparency and credibility to what's going on in the research. I think one of the best examples um, is by uh, Bessan Son et al. Right? In this paper, they said that what happened in 2020, 2021, and we're still living, there's a lot of research that is being published. But there are issues with how the science is conducted. I mentioned 400,000 articles or items in the WHO database. Are they all good? Are they all of the highest quality? Um, that's something that has been criticized, especially with the speed of publication. So in this paper, they looked at the scientific cycle above, as you can see here, from, uh, from the analysis, the interpretation, to doing a preprint, the manuscript, the peer review, the publication, and then distribution. And they've identified several potential issues when it comes to this structure. So for example, there might be a flawed design. Um, there might be a misinterpretation or misreporting of the data. Um, and then the fast track peer review, or um, maybe unreported conflicts of interest, or publishing in journals that are, let's say, maybe not credible or not trustworthy. And the idea is that open science can provide solutions in the different stages of this process, right? Um, so if you can look at this table, so for example, if you look at the data collection analysis, pre-registration of, um, of both the analysis and the data collection can address some of the duplications and ethical concerns. The duplications that many groups worldwide are doing many similar things. And it's a waste of effort and resources if there's multiple uh, efforts. Maybe it's, it's good to validate, but uh, pre-registration would allow groups to kind of maybe pivot away from doing a certain project and focusing on something as important. Um, open peer review, which I mentioned, can address the, the, the concerns about expedited uh, reviewing. And just to note, I'm not talking about issues here with open science or open access. This is a, a 
an issue with all research, whether it's subscription or maybe open science or open access. What I'm trying to explain here that is that some open science solutions or techniques or tools can help address this, right? So by, again, further on going, so with data and code sharing, you could, um, if you share the data, others can see um, the source information and how you reach your conclusions and analysis. And again, the last thing is with communication. So if you publish an open access, then everybody has access to information. So I invite you to, like, to read this in further detail. Um, because I think it's a really good uh, paper. Um, <clears throat> I've talked about open science, where it is, how it can help the health field maybe. Um, already some examples in, in, in the medical field and how this is conducted. What I would like to focus on, uh, focus on in the next couple of slides and for the remainder of my presentation today is that, yes, open science can be a solution, right? But the road is, well, tricky. It's a long road. We don't know how we're gonna get to the solution. And the reason is that there are challenges when it comes to implementation of open science. So <clears throat> so, some of the challenges. I mentioned build, building trust and credibility, right? Um, and I've mentioned some of the DOAJ, which is vital, the Think Check, think, check uh, Submit initiative. There are ethical and legal issues and funding issues, and of course, awareness and adoption. And I'm not here today to go on every single one and talk about details. But just to give you an example of ethical and legal issues. So ethics, if you're, if you're sharing data online, uh, you need to check about the sensitivity of the information. Do you have consent? Do you have uh, <clears throat> approval to, um, especially in trials, etc. do you have this consent? Um, and with legal, do you have the licensing, the, the copyright licensing or the licensing or approvals to publish those? Awareness and adoption is a continuous effort, you know, to, um, to, uh, for people to, um, to publish or actually use open science initiatives, they need to know about it and they need to be more comfortable about it. But this is like a long-term effort. What I want to focus on today is funding because I believe that if we can, so we can guarantee funding, then the rest can come. We can address the ethics, the legal issues, the awareness, and the trust and credibility. But what's important, and the question is, how can we make open science sustainable? And I would like to kind of um, focus on the financial sustainability. Now, what's sustainability? Right? What does sustainable mean? We hear it a lot, right? We hear this thing needs to be sustainable. And um, so what is it? You know, this is a nice quote. Um, so we were doing a, a project uh, recently with Scott and I got introduced to this quote, which I really, really liked. So sustainability is an orientation and not a destination. We can probably not get, not get there, but we work towards it. Uh, what's sustainable today may not be sustainable, uh, may be unsustainable tomorrow. So we always need to pivot, to change, to adapt, to evolve in what we're doing, to make things sustainable, right? And, and this may be specific to some kind of initiatives. Um, you may never arrive at full sustainability or permanent sustainability, but we should always walk or uh, go in the right direction. And when it comes to open science and sustainability, I'll be focusing right now on two different elements. <clears throat> the first one is open access publishing, and the second is open science infrastructure tools. Now, when it comes to open science, there's a, let's say, a school of thought, of, um, which is a kind of the infrastructure um, school of thought, let's say. And that's basically saying that if we have secured the infrastructure, and then we have everything else. And with the infrastructure, it's basically the tools this website, the sites, the, the programs, the services that we use 
to make everything here available as open. So that could mean the journals, you know, journals platform, that could mean um, the repositories and, um, and et cetera. So when it comes to sustainability of open science infrastructure, um, I want to talk about SCOS, which is a Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services. Now, I present the Qatar National Library on the board of SCOS, um, and also had the opportunity to chair the, the strategy project this year um, for SCOS. Now, what SCOS tries to address is the challenge that many open infrastructures were created using short-term project money, which is no longer uh, sustainable. So these companies or these initiatives, such as the UAJ, were set up with an ultimate goal to serve the community. And they've secured money on a short term. They have become successful. So the next step is how to continue the success and how to continue uh, their operations. And many of the many infrastructure, open infrastructures worldwide, face this financial issue. So here comes cost. It was set up in 2017. And the idea is to connect those who need funding with those who can provide it, right? So it's a very community-led approach. And um, what SCOS does, it, it, it helps vetting which open infrastructure needs support. Now, let me tell you the worst case scenario. If open infrastructures don't have money, they will close down. Right? And we will all suffer. Either that they, the operations are no longer available. And many of these cases, we actually don't pay money. Many of them are actually free to use. What could happen is they could be acquired by a commercial entity, and then we end up paying. So the idea, let's support now to avoid this worst case scenario, which is possible, by the way. So SCOS is a community led and governed by different uh, by the board, and it connects, as I mentioned, those who provide uh, open infrastructure services and those who can provide funding. And this is mostly government entities, uh, library consortia, and libraries. <clears throat> and on the board, you've got Spark Europe, Lever, uh, Eiffel, the Council of Australian University Librarians. The Association of Research Libraries, CARL uh, in Canada, that's the Association of African Universities, um, France, I'm not gonna try to attempt to read out in French, and also Qatar National Library. So uh, we are as COS is global, and the idea is to have more global representation. Uh, so far, 283 institutions have supported um, the initiatives that were selected or vetted by SCOS. This money has come for 21 different countries and eight infrastructure infrastructures have been supported so far. And about three, I would say about three and a half million euros were contributed to infrastructure. So who are, what, what, what who, are, who are we talking about? And I do hope that when I'm presenting some of these initiatives that you'd recognize them. And I do hope that it would connect that you actually use them and that you need them, and hopefully you will choose to support them. So Sherpa Romeo, uh, for the first cycle of 2017 or 18 when it was launched, um, so two initiatives were chosen. Sherpa Romeo, which is a database of, that shows the open uh, policies for publishers, and the Directory of Open Access Journals, which I mentioned as a, as a source of credibility. Now for us as a library, we actually, use DOIJ on a daily basis. Whenever we get a funding request, we go on the DOIJ. Now the DOIJ is great because it also provides credit, like not only credibility for the journals, but visibility, you know? Uh, so it's extremely important. And what happened, um, I think the DOIJ is the first success, success story of SCOS that it reached its 100% target uh, last year of 1.4 million euros. The second funding cycle, uh, the Director of Open Access Journals, and open, uh, open citations, and the PKP. Now, I do hope, I mean, like you've recognized them because for me personally, I've worked with the PKP in different projects as when I was working in publishing. And for example, PKP provides all the 
that it provides OGS, Open Journal Systems, and I think the Open Conference System as well. So many journals, many university presses worldwide rely on PKP. And now I can show you that, for example, some of them are reaching their targets, others haven't. And the third cycle was launched recently. We have Archive, Redelic, uh, America, and DSpace. Now, Archive with, with Cornell um, is one of the first preprints, one of the most important preprints in, in, in the field, physics and mathematics. And DSpace, um, so let me tell you a bit more. So, you know, it has a 30, Archive has a 30 year uh, history. Um, it has 2 million scholarly articles in eight different subjects. Red in America is based in, uh, it's, it's very vital in, in, in Latin America, which is a platform, and it shows a platform of open access peer reviewed journals from 600 different institutions from 31 different countries. And of course, this space is infrastructure for many open repositories worldwide and supports 3,000 academic libraries. I mentioned QSpace. QSpace is based on DSpace. So if anything happens to DSpace, QSpace will be affected. So that shows kind of the importance of how we as librarians, we as universities, as research institutions rely on every single infrastructure in many, on many different levels. So if you're interested in supporting them, please do contact Scott, and I do hope that, you know, um, you can convince your institutions to pledge. One of the myths that I discussed in the beginning was that access to publication or access to information is indeed a problem. <clears throat> this is a thought experiment. <clears throat> If you, as a researcher, publish an article in, um, if you publish an article in a journal and it's behind the paywall or it's inaccessible or inaccessible and nobody has access to it, can you say that you have published an article? What's the point of publishing something that nobody can read? or that somebody has to pay 40 euros or even more to read an article. If nobody reads your work, I mean, I understand there's pressure from authors to, to continue research, to continue publication for, let's say, professional reasons. But let's talk about the science for a minute. Let's talk about when researchers are decide to dedicate their lives to science. Maybe you're in high school, maybe you're in university. But at that point, you didn't want tenure. You didn't think about becoming a professor or publishing 100 articles. What you wanted was to make the world a better place, to make science as a tool to solve problems, right? So <clears throat> open access and publishing your articles open in an open manner supports that. Supports that ultimate goal of scientific communication. But I mentioned also that Money is a problem, right? Uh, open access journals are becoming more expensive year on year. You would think that the more journals that you have, that um, the price might go down, but it doesn't work that way. So the prices have been going up and up. Um, competition rules, I guess, didn't kind of apply here, but so it goes up and up. One journal, I'm not gonna mention, <clears throat> but one journal um, reported that it's, APC is 10,000 euro. It's crazy, right? Um, but the way that this could be supported is through institution, institutional, through an institutional approach to pay article processing charges. Individuals, authors should not be responsible for paying from their own pocket. It happens, right? It happens, unfortunately, but they shouldn't do that. So the question is, how does this institutional um, support look like? Libraries institutions can have agreements. So you could support open access for your research through publishing agreements. You can do it through a consortium. So basically a group of libraries coming together and negotiating 
uh, with publishers for, a, let's say, a consortium level agreement, which is much better value than individual agreements. When you're doing this, or libraries, when they're doing this, they should think about these open principles. Will the information be openly cyclable? Or can, can authors reuse the content? How much is, um, what happens with open access? Can we do preprints? Can we do data mining? So in many of our agreements, we actually introduce data mining as, um, as an access right, right? Um, as libraries, as institutions, we need to think about different business models, right? Not only supporting those who uh, convert articles from a subscription to make it open access, but supporting fully open access business models or supporting infrastructure or supporting different ways. Because as a, as a unit, as an institution of, uh, approach, we need to reach a level of, let's say, um, I want to call it independency, but like a symbiosis. Institutions should be relying on these, uh, we wish we already do, we rely on these initiatives, but there should be a kind of a mutual uh, give and take. And in all things, we need to think about sustainability. If we can pay an agreement now, if we can pay an APC now, what can we do in five years? Do we do to continue the same thing? Do we try to negotiate better? Do we try to have better agreements? Let me give you an example of how we do it in Qatar. So we have the Qatar National Library Consortium, which is um, which constitutes of or has like different ten or has 10 different libraries in Qatar, which we work together. We negotiate as, as one. So we have, we enter agreements with publishers. And the idea here is that what we're trying to do is to leverage or the shift the cost. So traditionally libraries would pay a subscription fee to the publisher, a hundred thousand, thousands more. What we're saying is that we want to pay more for publishing rather than subscription. We might pay you the same amount of money overall, but what we, what we want is that, yeah, we want subscription or we want access to the content, but we also want that any paper published by a Qatar-based researcher in your journals or your portfolio is made open access. And over time, we want to pay more for publishing and less for subscription. And we think this is fair because the, uh, the publishers would also get the same money, but we get more. And we get more by working together. Now, the, these agreements, and we've, Qatar National Library had the first agreement in the region with Elsevier, Wiley, Springer Nature, Taylor Francis, I took them and many more. In all these agreements, we look at how many articles are published by each publisher per year from Qatar. And the idea is that all of them are made open access, in addition to getting access to information uh, for all the other channels or other content. So this, these agreements address, so this institution and way of what we're doing can work for others. And it addresses the absence of institutional funds and mandates for open access. And it does make an impact because I mentioned that more than 50% of publications in Qatar are made open access now. And this is great on a national level. It increases citations for Qatar research. It positions Qatar, not only as a, as a region leader in science, but also in open access adoption. Now I mentioned a key thing is that, uh, well, and again, just so before I talk about that, um, all this information of how we're doing it with consortia, we believe in transparency, we believe in um, sharing back. So all of our data and all the, for what we support is, actually uploaded to the Open APC initiative, which many countries worldwide do as well. The idea here is that we announce how much we're paying for each publisher on an Arctic level. And this idea here that introduces transparency. Um, and it allows us even to negotiate better. If we say we're paying double of what others are paying, well, there's, something, there's something wrong there, right? We also, many, um, let's say, European countries also publish their agreements and we heavily um, rely on those. You know, we, we, um, it's like this brings in a larger transparency and much more transparency worldwide. So other universities, other libraries worldwide can benefit from that. 
What was key, however, is that, yes, okay, yeah, we have an institutional support, but how can we get it? And the idea that key stakeholders must have better engagement. We need to meet, I mean, we, any, in, any, in any kind of environment, the key stake, stakeholders need to uh, meet and plan together. So when it comes to open science and open research, yes, the library might be a, a vital player, but you also have the research institutions, the authors, the funding agencies. Right? <clears throat> we need to work together. And here I want to talk about the prisoners that have, has nothing to do with open science, but just an, as an, a, an example of how we can do things. So in the prisoner's dilemma, yes, it's game theory, we have two guilty prisoners, right? So they're in prison and they are, um, they've committed a crime. So the police would come and tell them, okay, we will we, we, talk to each one individually and to give them a deal. Tell us who did it and you'll get off for free, right? So this kind of, uh, it's actually interesting. So, um, so this matrix here shows how they benefit or lose depending on how they collaborate or work individually. So if A is silent, so if A betrays B, so A goes and says, yeah, he did it. Then A goes out for free, doesn't get any jail time, but B has three years and the other way around. So if B betrays A, B goes out for free, no prison, and, and A gets three years. Now, human nature dictates that they might both betray each other, right? So there's a bit of lack of trust in this scenario. Both of them get two years. But if they both stay silent and work together, then each of them get a year and a year. And, and yes, maybe a year in prison in this scenario is not the best, but it's best for both of them overall. Now, if you think of how stakeholders should engage with each other, if each stakeholder, or each institution, or each library, even library, uh, when it comes to agreements, work separately, we all lose. We always pay more. And we have this, we've known this, we, Libraries who, like other consortia, are having one agreement, the whole, all of the institutions pay less, maybe, and get better value. But if each one goes separately, then they all lose. And the same thing when it comes to open science. If all the uh, stakeholders work together, there's a high probability of uh, winning. But if each institution, if each researcher uh, or university goes separately in libraries, then Overall, the whole system uh, um, suffers. And there's enough, when it comes to open access publishing, there is enough money in the system. We just have to put it together. We just have to figure out a way of bringing everything together. What does the library have? What does the institution have? And then and the research funding agencies and put this together. And that way, that there, there could be an institutional, institutional way of supporting open access. And besides money, of course, there's always policies and mandates. Right, so you need, and maybe these policies and mandates can support, you know, the engagement and working together. So a raw map is the registry of open access repository of mandates and policies, and it shows, <coughs> excuse me, it shows um, by country where these repos, uh, where these is mandates are. The mandates are saying, okay, you need to publish open access, or you, that you need to put it either in a journal or a repository, etc. And you can see a region, I mean, this, it has nothing. It's mostly in Europe, um, maybe in North America, so, uh, Latin America, Latin America, um, in Australia, but in this region, we don't have a lot. So there's a lot of work for us to do. And one thing maybe that influenced the growth in Europe was the PLANAS. So PLANAS, um, a group of funding agencies and funding bodies came together and decided that all their Articles by uh, from 2021 should be made uh, in open access journals or open access platforms. And they mandated this on the recipients of the funds. I'm not going through the whole thing, but the idea, the general concept is that um, you, they have either in platforms or in journals, and these journals need to 
publish in the most liberal um, open access license. So not restrictive in any manner. And the goal of kind of plan S is to encourage the adoption of open access, but also the growth um, of open access publishers and journals. Because one thing that's in there is not only to transform existing journals to become open access, if they were a subscription, but also to support other initiatives. So maybe new journals will come up. And so the idea is that on the long term, um, by enforcing this, you'll have an open access kind of uh, landscape. Now this probably is only limited in certain countries. We don't have it here yet, but I think in Qatar, that's something that we could work with. Um, <clears throat> so the solutions that so far, you've got national funders from around the world, from the UK, from Europe, um, other kind of charitable international funding agencies such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the World Health Organization, all, and of course, the European funders are part of us. So that's with advocacy and uh, on, a, on an institution level. But as an individual, what can we do? Well, you can do a lot, right? And let's step back from open access. I mean, I'm, right now I'm talking about open science. And today I've introduced to you the idea of open science that can be good for health, good for health information, good for the medical field. I talk about challenges and I talked about funding issues and how we can work uh, as an institution. But you as an individual, what you can do is like, at least you can go read about uh, and discover more about open science. Um, you can publish in an open access journal. You can decide to uh, prepare like, your data in an open access repository or publish them in an open access repository. Or um, you can try out peer review. Or maybe as a library, you can go and set up an open access fund, maybe. Or talk to your grant institution um, or support. <clears throat> okay, there's a lot of, and what I mean is like there's a lot of uh, on the advocacy front that you can do. And one thing just to remind you is that libraries are your best friends. Talk to your librarians, talk to your libraries. Libraries are in the business of providing information and open access is the best way to provide information for everybody. With that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and uh, uh, I think that was it for me, but thank you for your attention. And yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Great, thank you so much for that very interesting journey through open access and open science and where things are currently uh, here in Qatar. So we do have a few questions. Um, the first one is, how do you think open science can make complex ideas and the normal disagreements in science more understandable for the public? So how do you think open science can make complex ideas and the normal disagreements in science more understandable for the public? All right. So um, I've talked about citizen science and I've talked about how access to information is, uh, so with the public, they don't have to rely on, let's say, digested information by others, other uh, like, uh, either the news agencies or whatever, they can actually go to the source directly, right? Now, of course, if I'm going to read an article on mitochondrial biogenesis or something, I might not understand it, right? And, and so there might be too technical for me. But what's great about open access and open access publications is that they could be reused. The text can be taken, can be made simpler. And there are many initiatives uh, that would, uh, take uh, like an article, simplify it in a sense that could be understood by the public and republish them. And the great thing is that the licenses allow them to do so. If they were not open access, you wouldn't be able to do that. And there's actually one of my favorite examples, um, I forgot the name, but it's a journal in, in Switzerland and it's a journal for kids. So even if you think not only the public as like adults, but even children, so what, um, it's for treats for young minds, right? So what they do is they take new science articles, they write them in a very simplified manner for, and with, 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 uh, character, with cartoons and everything and they publish them for kids. And the kids are also peer reviewers. 
So just an example of how the strength of the, the licensing there works. Um, so yeah, um, the licensing allowed like, <clears throat> to address that, either getting to the source or relying on sources that would make it simplified. So what do you see as next steps in moving the conversation around open access and open science forward? So that, so there's like, again, there's like a local, local steps and there's like global steps. Locally, <clears throat> maybe I can start with that. As a community here in Tata, we need to meet more often. Of course, we've got the consortium, but we need to have more venues for discussion. Uh, for ideas, and we do that like let's say ad hoc. I mean, with our researchers, so we support them. We do these focus groups, and we try to understand better. But we need to do it on an institution level. I mentioned that <clears throat> that there's enough money in the system, and I, I do believe in that because we thought, okay, if we were to join Plan Us, how much would it cost? And we did that in kind of 2018, and we found it's only a couple million dollars. It's a lot, but relative to how what is spent on research, that's possible. So we need to get together uh, locally. Um, on a global level, I think um, I'm gonna say the infrastructure. So institutions need to support infrastructure. The idea is that if these infrastructure, which I believe all of us use from Directive Open Access Journal to Sherpa Romania or even PKP or Open Citations, we need to keep them, we need to ensure their survival. And I guess engagement on kind of just uh, more awareness and advocacy in both local and global fronts. So following on your comments on infrastructure. So another question is, so you talked about infrastructure changes such as new mandates coming in to support the move to open science. So when speaking to say an individual researcher um, to generate excitement and, and buy-in for this movement, what two benefits do you think are the most important to be highlighted during the conversations that we have? For an individual, I mean, the interests are different, right? For an institution level, let me speak, we can start from there. From an institution level, um, we, I guess we can see it from a big picture, sustainability, long-term survival of open science. But on an individual level, that doesn't always translate because an individual have individual needs. So I think the primary thing is the benefits that comes to an author, let's say from, for with open access publication, an example, or open data, more visibility, uh, high reputation either through citations or just through readership. I mentioned the altmetric because you know, we rely on citations and impact factor as, as a criteria, but there's much more. Um, and I think from an individual level, and oh, we see that here when we talk with authors, they believe or they understand or they appreciate the benefits of open access. So I think that's really the criteria. If you make it more open, people would read your work more. People would trust your work more and people would reuse your work. So in all cases, you benefit. Great. Well, you mentioned Altmetric and you mentioned it in your <clears> presentation. <throat> so thinking about the along the lines of evaluation, um, what new metrics do you think might need to be considered to evaluate open science and open <laughs> initiatives? Uh, to evaluate the open initiatives, you mean, or like, okay. Um, well, that's a tricky question, right? <laughs> so, um, do you mean like evaluating the initiatives themselves or like um, the output of it? It could be either. It could be either. So uh, when it comes to open initiatives, I think we need to understand the usage better, right? So um, yes, we might have an open access, open initiative, right? Um, and, if, and, and but we need to know the importance of it as well. Um, who's using it? How are they using it? And I think there should be a conversation between the community who's actually using these tools and those who are providing it. <clears throat> so I kind of, from an infrastructure perspective, uh, if there are any comment changes, requests, what can, I think these need to evolve uh, as the, the, the needs of the, the users evolve. But I think uh, usage metrics and et cetera would be much more beneficial, at least with, uh, uh, open science initiatives, initiatives, or at least open infrastructure with initiatives, maybe there could be uh, another uh, body that could evaluate this. Why not? I mean, like we know that we evaluate every single part of the process. 
from peer review. And, but let's say, why not have a body that evaluates the process? That could work on sustainability. We know that we agree, but we nice to have. <laughs> Well, and with that, uh, that wraps up the session for today. Thank you so much for your time and expertise. Uh, we will be taking a short break and hope everybody will join us back at 1015 for our next round of presentations. Dr. Alkaja, thank you very thank much. You thank you very much for this opportunity and you know, kudos for everybody who's uh, supported this symposium. It's a great uh, event. So I look forward to hearing the remainder of the presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.